Hello again Year 8, week 11 now, this is going to be our last video on Of Mice and Men Distance Learning. Gosh, it's been a long time now, hasn't it? This is lesson 28 and 29. So we are going to begin with lesson 28, the title Am I My Brother's Keeper? And our lesson objective here is to apply biblical analogy to Of Mice and Men. Some quite tricky words in there, so biblical meaning of the Bible and analogy. Now an analogy is something we're going to learn a little bit more about in the next part of this lesson. So what is an analogy? An analogy, which is a very difficult phrase to say, an analogy is a story which is comparable to another story or another set of events. So it might be that um, one particular story has lots in common with another story. And that's kind of the idea we're going to be exploring today, that the narrative arc or the narrative structure, if you like, between two stories can be quite similar. And sometimes writers do that deliberately to try and suggest something about their story. So something you might already be aware of that you might have covered in RS so far this year. You might be aware of the analogy behind the idea of the Chronicles of Narnia. So, you know, Lion, Witch in the Wardrobe, The Voyage of the Dawn Treader, all of those has lots in common with the Bible. So, for example, the character of Aslan, the lion, how is he a bit like Jesus? He's definitely a bit like a Messiah kind of creature, isn't he? And he sacrifices himself so that others can live, and yet he is resurrected. So Aslan is definitely um, a slight kind of Jesus metaphor. But this idea of analogy, and particular biblical analogy, is actually really common in literature that comes particularly from the West. So places like uh, Western Europe in particular, and in America. And that's not to say that a lot of texts are inherently religious, but religion, and particularly Christian religion, is such a strong part of our culture that we often don't even realise that we're adding these, um, these narrative tropes into our stories. I had a really interesting conversation with Miss Beat recently, who's head of RS at our school. We were talking about how George Floyd has, in fact, been made into a martyr. People talk about the fact that he made this great sacrifice by dying and now the world can be a better place. Actually, you're applying quite um, quite a strong Christian allegory onto that by saying that this man almost chose to be chose to be an example. He didn't choose to do that. So it's interesting how the idea of, you know, martyrdom can be applied to people, even if, you know, that religious aspect was never part of their story. Um, another interesting thing we talked about was the idea that when people, when something terrible happens, people tend to say, my thoughts and prayers are with them, even if they are not actually religious, they still use the idea of prayer. So it's interesting to look at how religious language and religious tropes, particularly Christian tropes in Western society, do kind of find their way into our everyday language and our everyday literature. So you're going to go off to a different YouTube channel very briefly. This is brilliant, this website. I think this guy's great. Um, you are going to watch a video from the guy called um, Sparky Sweets, who runs the channel Thug Notes. And he argues that of mice and men, the story that we've been studying, has all has got some kind of similarities with um, parts of the Bible, particularly the Old Testament. Now, if you're not clear, there are two parts to the Bible, the Old Testament, which obviously came first and is also um, held as sacred by Jewish people. And then the New Testament, which is kind of like Jesus and afterwards. Um, and that's the Christian part of the Bible, the purely Christian part. So pause our video, go and have a look at Thug Notes of Mice and Men, and feel free to go back later and look at some of his other videos as well, because he's brilliant. So this theory then, that of Mice and Men, the kind of the relationship between Lenny and George, is actually an allegory for the story of Cain and Abel. Now, you what I've got to remember here is this is just a theory. This is not definitely true. Nobody, you know, knocked up Steinbeck and said, oh, was this what you actually intended? But the idea that the text is based on more than just this story gives us more ideas to discuss. So the idea of what does it mean to have a brother? What does it mean to be responsible for somebody else? By looking at the similarity between these two stories, it opens up much more interesting conversations about things like themes, for example. 
And now next year, in year nine, we are going to start by studying Animal Farm, which uses allegory, which is really, really similar to analogy. So analogy is like two similar stories together. And allegory is a bit like more like a fable, a bit like a fairy story. But the two are incredibly similar. So if you can get your head around the idea of an analogy, Animal Farm will also be much, much easier for you. So we're going to test this idea that the Thug Notes guy proposed by looking at a passage from Genesis. Now, this is the very, very first part of the Old Testament. It's printed in your home learning booklet, but I'm also going to read it with you. Now, I'd like when we read through it to think about where there might be some similarities with parts of the story or parts of the context in particular for Of Mice and Men. Now, personally, I am not religious, but that doesn't mean that I don't appreciate how beautifully written parts of the Bible are. So let's take a look at this passage here. It's not too difficult to understand. You will also notice there are some little numbers all the way through. Those are the different verses within the chapter of the Bible, because the Bible is essentially a form of poetry, a form of literature. So that is what those little numbers are for, if you weren't sure. OK, a bit from Genesis then. Here we go. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother, Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought forth some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of his firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked down on favor with uh, looked down with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. So Cain uh, is a, they're both farmers. These brothers, one of them brings forth crops, and that's Cain because he works the soil, and Abel is the one who keeps animals and raises livestock. And they both bring an offering of their kind of their produce, if you like, to God. But God looks more favorably on the idea of raising livestock than he does on raising crops. And for this reason, Cain gets very angry. Then the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. So God gives uh, Cain a bit of a warning here. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, okay, where are we up to? Uh, now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Those of you that know your Steinbeck will know that one of Steinbeck's novels is called East of Eden. So what does this all mean then? So if we think about that passage, particularly the idea that things will not grow for um, for Cain anymore. Does that not link back to the idea of the Great Depression and the idea of uh, soil erosion, the idea that you will be a restless wanderer on the earth and that there were these migrant workers traveling all over the USA and that idea of being responsible for your fellow man, am I my brother's keeper? So it's, po it's possible that Steinbeck saw part of this biblical analogy, uh, sorry, this, this Bible story, and thought he could see some similarities in the time he was writing and decided to use the idea of two men, those that one that kind of represents all the reason and the kind of the the man that the kind of the uh, the higher qualities of reason, intelligence, logic, and one that represents the kind of the bestial, uh, the one that represents the animal instincts and kind of evolves these characters into George and Lenny. 
So let's take this a little bit further then. Are there any other places in Of Mice and Men that you think have a slightly biblical feel to them? So the idea of the Garden of Eden, the idea of that paradise, perhaps. I definitely can think of somewhere that is definitely reminiscent of the idea of a paradise where nature seems completely at peace and it is, it's a wonderful setting. Can you think where that is in the novel? What about the idea of Eve and temptation, the, tempt the temptress, the woman who tempts you to do bad things? And, uh, well, even that phrase, I done a bad thing. Does Lenny not, in fact, say that phrase? The idea of baptism, the idea that water will kind of help you to be reborn in some way, or the idea that your sins can be washed away. Is that appearing anywhere in the novel, perhaps? And what about the idea of the devil or serpents? Who do you think, if, there, if the devil were to be in this story, where would he be? And also, are there image, is there imagery of serpents anywhere in the novel? Or, I don't know, water snakes at all? So what is Steinbeck getting at by doing all of this? If, he, if these kind of um, analogies that he uses that are related to the Bible are on purpose, what is he trying to tell us? Is this a message about the downfall of man? Because ultimately that's what the story of the Garden of Eden is all about, that Adam and Eve were created by man, they uh, were created by God, they didn't do as they were told, and they were cast out. To be, to be, they were cast out of paradise, and that's why all people now, according to Christianity, have original sin. And the idea is that you have to do as you're told. So what is Steinbeck doing by kind of evoking these ideas linked into the idea of religion? Is this a story about, um, you know, living a sinful life? Is this a story about doing as you're told? Is this a story about the downfall of man? Is it a, sto is it a story about fate and destiny, perhaps, that this is the way that it goes for man? We think everything's going to be all right in paradise, but then something happens and we are cast out of paradise and destined not to live the dream that we wanted to. OK, so two ideas that we've discussed during this unit of Of Mice and Men, the idea of an analogy, a story which is comparable to another story or set of events in significant respects. And then microcosm, a mini society, the idea that all aspects of society are represented within one setting. So we've talked about the bunkhouse, uh, sorry, not the bunkhouse, the um, the bit in the barn where um, Lenny goes to see Crooks. We said that all the four characters who Lenny's, who uh, Curly's wife describes as the weak ones, they represent a kind of mini society. All aspects of society are represented on that one ranch. How are these two concepts of analogy and microcosm, how are they similar? And how are they different? That's really complicated. It might, if your head is hurting while you're trying to think about that, you're probably doing it right. OK, that concludes our lesson on the idea of analogy. OK, your final lesson then on Of Mice and Men is a writing challenge to show your knowledge of the whole novel. Your task is to write an essay explaining why George had to shoot Lenny. Uh, spoiler alert there if you hadn't read the end of the novel yet. The method you're going to include, we will go through in the next couple of slides and also some vocabulary that we'd like you to include. So let's start with that. So dilemma, if you are uh, faced with a dilemma, you are faced with a very difficult decision and usually a dilemma it does not give you an easy choice. So George, you could quite easily say, has a dilemma in how he should approach um, the topic of Lenny once he has killed Curly's wife. Then you've got the adjective accountable. So if you are accountable for something, you are responsible or to be answerable. Someone is gonna want to know why you made a decision about something and that makes you accountable. Then crucial. Crucial is a weird one. It doesn't sound much like it's pronounced. And it, it comes from the same root word as the idea of, um, cr I think it's the same one as crisis or critical. So something very important, something that is essential is crucial. So to practice using that vocab, if you didn't know it before, uh, write a sentence for each word that could go into your essay about why George had to shoot Lenny. Pause the video. Do that now, please, in your workbook. Look. OK, let's look at these methods we've got to include. Most of these we've come across so far. but There's a couple of examples with each one that you might want to use in your response. So quotation from the novel, uh, a direct line or phrase from Of Mice and Men. So you might use something like in Chapter 5, Slim says, I guess we got to get him. And of course, that's got quite a loaded, uh, quite a loaded message to it when Slim says that to George. In Chapter 3, Candy says, I shouldn't have let no stranger shoot my dog. And we talked before about the similarity between Candy and having the dog shot and George having to shoot Lenny. The idea of responsibility coming up again. 
Uh, discourse marker, we've done that loads now. It's the signpost in your writing, usually starting a new paragraph, almost always has a comma straight after it as well. It's the bit where you say, and now I'm going to talk about something else. Usually at the beginning of a paragraph with a comma afterwards. I'd like you to have a go at including also a metaphor. Now, lots of times in non-fiction, students go, but I can't use a metaphor because metaphors are for, de for descriptive writing. Actually, that's not entirely true. In our everyday language, we tend to use metaphors without even realising it. So a metaphor is imagery used to convey a similar situation, but it's non-literal. A simile would say as, um, but a metaphor says was or is. So, for example, George is clearly crushed by Lenny's death. Now, George is not literally being squashed by something, but it gives you the idea that he is being destroyed by it or that his entire being is being reduced in some way, that he is being oppressed by it. And that is a metaphor. There's another one here. Lenny was able to George's cane. So if you um, really got your head around the idea of analogy that we were just talking about, why not use this in the essay? One of your arguments could be George had to shoot Lenny because Cain kills Abel in the Bible and do your essay about that. That would be a real challenge. I'd be really impressed if I could read an essay like that. Have a go at including a rhetorical question because, of course, it's very difficult. So, well, why on earth did he have to kill Lenny? That could be your rhetorical question. It is a question, though, therefore, not designed to be answered. It's designed to be thought provoking. So some may ask, was it truly necessary for George to kill Lenny? Or how about, was George always have... Uh, from the beginning, was George always having to go to kill? Uh, uh, let's fudge my words. Was George always going to have to kill Lenny? There you go. Got it out eventually. Semicolons, um, they replace a connective within a compound sentence. Usually they would replace things like and, but, so. But your semicolon clearly, does, clearly kind of signpost a connection between the two halves of your sentence. So look at my two examples here. Lenny always destroyed the things he touched. Curly's wife was no different. So you might have, instead of used a semicolon there, you might have used the word and instead. But instead, we've taken out and and we've put in a semicolon. Here's another one. George knew he had to kill Lenny. Slim knew it too. So again, semicolon there could have been an and, but we've put a semicolon instead. That's the easiest way to get a semicolon into your writing. Try and get two in over the course of your essay. And then finally, this one I think is going to be quite tricky because single word sentences do tend to work slightly better in polemic writing in the one where you're expressing a point of view. But what you're doing here is actually explaining. We'd like to try and get a sentence of only one word. Now, you could actually combine the idea of a rhetorical question here, which is what I've done in the last example. So you could have something like brutal, tragic, murder? Question mark. Now, that could be quite a thought provoking way to um, start one of your ideas off. So that is your task. Write an essay explaining why George had to shoot Lenny. I haven't given you a structure for this essay. I'd like you to aim, though, between three to four paragraphs. Show, show your teacher your knowledge of the novel as a whole and the, idea, the ideas that we've kind of discussed over the last uh, 11, 12 weeks or so. That should take you between 30 and 40 minutes, year eight. And that's it. We have finished our unit on Of Mice and Men. You've got one final, uh, slightly longer quiz on Show My Homework on the novel as a whole, just to test that you've actually understood it. And the next two weeks on Show My Homework will be flexi tasks. So you don't need to hand those tasks in. They're just kind of stuff to keep you busy or little project that you can do on Of Mice and Men. So well done for getting to the end of the course. And I hope that you enjoy your summer. Who knows, we may be using these videos again if coronavirus or God knows some other hideous disease decides to close schools down again. Uh, well done and hopefully I'll see you soon in school.